Great, thanks Charlie and Meredith. Um, oh, good morning, everyone. In 1920, Charles Edward Winslow, the father of American public health, offered the following as a definition of public health. The science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through organized efforts and choices of societies, organizations, communities, and lastly, individuals. Lastly was mine, but that's the point. The current pandemic has cast global attention on the microbial world in which we social animals evolved. Communicable diseases blurring the boundaries between separating individual and group vulnerability to disease and the futility of trying to understand one outside the context of the other. And this is something that Winslow recognized a century ago. But it turns out there's even far more ancient insights um, that can into the relationship between the microbial world, individuals and communities. And uh, I'm referring to the social systems of insects. And today's speaker and panel members have tremendous expertise in this. I've been reading um, some of their work and I'm really thrilled uh, to be introducing them. So uh, here is who we have this morning. Our speaker is Dr. Sylvia Kramer. Uh, who is a full professor at the Institute of Science and Technology in Austria. She works at the interface of behavioral ecology and evolutionary immunology using social insects, particularly ants, as a model system to understand cooperative disease defenses. Our panelists are Dr. Natalie Stromite, a senior lecturer in animal behavior at the School of Biological Sciences, University of Bristol in the UK. Her research focuses on collective behavior as social insects, particularly how collective organization influences disease transmission risk within colonies. And finally, uh, Dr. Chris Poole, I'm not sure if Chris is on yet, um, but he should be soon, if not already, uh, is a lecturer in animal behavior at the University of Oxford. He completed his doctoral studies in Dr. Kramer's lab. His research expertise includes social immunity in ants and the evolution of bee cognition. Dr. Kramer, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the nice introduction, for the possibility to speak here. I will share my screen again to uh, start the talk. I hope everybody sees this now. Um, yeah, so um, as I was very nicely introduced, um, <laughs> we are talking about uh, social immunity today. And uh, this is the uh, cooperative disease defense in social insect colonies. Um, and um, the people who have contributed to everything that I'm going to speak about today are several people from my group and also Natalie, who has been at the University of Lausanne when we had the collaboration that I'm presenting today and is now at Bristol and uh, is also um, participating in the conversation that we aim to have after the talk with you. Um, so uh, as you have seen, uh, Natalie is already uh, here and also Chris, a former PhD student in my lab, um, is participating in our conversation following the talk, uh, mostly about social distancing and social immunization in ants. I don't think I have to spell out in a lot of detail in these days that there is an inherent problem of societies, be it human societies or also um, social insect societies that under crowded conditions with a lot of contact between group members, there is a high um, probability for infectious diseases to spread uh, between uh, members of the group. And um, so this means that the, the social interactions can promote disease transmission. And uh, this is particularly so in the colonies of the social insects uh, that have a very um, frequent and very close social interactions. For example, they share food by regurgitation towards one another. They are also constantly licking the body surface of each other to exchange um, their body surface chemicals to obtain a joint colony odor. And all these very close social interactions are obviously likely to promote infectious disease between them. 
Um, on the other hand, however, I have been studying over the past decade or even longer how the hygiene behaviors that these animals are performing can actually reduce the risk of disease, particularly when they are performed collectively. So I would like to introduce to you the concept of social immunity. So if you here see a single individual, each individual has a way to protect itself against disease by a combination of some behavioral defenses such as a pathogen avoidance and hygiene, um, as well as its own physiological immune system. Um, however, when then uh, several of these individuals are cooperating and are performing hygiene towards one another as well as together, then the emergent property of social immunity um, to protect the whole reproductive unit of the colony can emerge. And this is what we basically have termed social immunity. So um, I would like in this talk to basically show you that social immunity can reduce disease at uh, multiple with multiple mechanisms. So on one hand, it can reduce the pathogen load. It can also reduce the host susceptibility as well as disease transmission through the uh, colony, through the group. So um, I'm studying mostly as a model system fungal diseases in ants. And as you can see here, we use ant hosts and we rear fungal pathogens in the laboratory. For example, here the green muscadine disease that we are using and that is an obligate killing pathogen uh, of the ants. So if all the avoidance strategies and the defense strategies are failing, uh, then the individuals get killed by this fungal pathogen, leading to the outgrowth um, and the sporulation again um, out of the cadavers, which means that you have a next cycle of infection going on due to these um, infectious particles. So um, we have been uh, studying how ants uh, can prevent um, disease uh, coming from this system. And uh, the first is um, that they perform sanitation by nest hygiene. So um, Chris has shown that uh, the ants are um, using their formic acid poison, which these ants are spraying because they are uh, formicine ants. Uh, they use this uh, formic acid to apply it into their nest chambers. Um, and this is visualized in this photograph by uh, putting the ants on a pH sensitive um, paper that is typically blue and turns pink when it comes in contact uh, with uh, the acid and you can see here particular spraying events, particularly around uh, the brood chamber uh, that really uh, show that there's a lot of application of formic acid and it is known and we have also shown this is that formic acid has a, a strong antimicrobial activity. So um, in addition to nest hygiene um, that is directed to the nest environment, there is also sanitary care towards uh, pathogen exposed individuals in the colony. And this is mostly done by allogrooming. So uh, this means that um, if you have a pathogen exposed um, nest mate or individual in the colony, then the healthy nest mates are going to um, groom off uh, the infectious particles from the body surface uh, of the exposed individual. And this is uh, shown here. They basically use their uh, mouth parts uh, to remove uh, the infectious particles mechanically. But at the same time, they are also kind of spitting out formic acid that they have previously taken up into their mouth from their own, own poison gland. So uh, allogrooming is a combination of a mechanical removal and a chemical disinfection of the pathogens. And um, 
a lot of other groups and also our own data have shown that this is leading to a reduced disease risk of contaminated colony members. Um, in addition, we were interested to see uh, what this um, sanitary care and this close social contact to pathogen exposed individual has as an effect on these nest mates that are performing the sanitary care. So uh, this brings me to the point of looking at how does interaction with um, infectious individual, individuals is actually affecting uh, the host susceptibility and the future resistance um, of the individuals that are living together with this um, exposed nest mate in the colony. So um, basically we asked um, or we suspect that, um, that performing sanitary care would um, have a risk of pathogen transfer to the nest mate. So we have been looking whether this is uh, really occurring. And uh, on one hand, we found that really we could find spores transmitted to the body surface uh, of the nest mate ants. Um, and we also then checked whether these nest mates really experience an internal infection because uh, what these uh, fungi do, the spores are attaching to the body surface and they are then integrating into the body by penetrating the body surface. So we dissected the body content and basically just plated it in agar plates to count the colony forming units. And we did this on one hand for the directly exposed individuals that we exposed experimentally by dipping them into a spore suspension. And what you can see here, each um, plate represents a single end. You can see here that um, most of the individuals, 90% of the individuals actually, um, they had uh, an infection and they had a lot of colony forming units in their bodies. If we did the same with the nest mates, you can see that actually also somewhat more than half of them, so um, about 65% of these nest mates, they also carried an infection, but it was much lower. And just to show you this now in uh, numbers instead of uh, just pictures, how these nest mates are contracting infections. You can see here um, that with the dose that we applied, we had about 90% uh, of the directly exposed individuals uh, were having an internal infection versus about 65% of the nest mates. But what you can see here is um, that the overall pathogen load of a nest mate was about 12 fold smaller than that of a directly exposed individual. So um, we had actually chosen a dose for our experiment that was an LD50, so induced a 50% mortality in the um, directly exposed individuals. And we were kind of surprised to see that uh, nearly none of the nest mates actually contracted the disease, even if we knew that 65% of them actually contracted the pathogen. So I think it's really important to differentiate between pathogen transmission and disease transmission or disease um, uh, development based on pathogen transmission. So basically we can see that the exposed individuals have a high level infection where the, the nest mates have a low level infection. And the majority of these caregivers are then developing these asymptomatic low level infections due to the social contact. We then um, wanted to see um, what this uh, low level infection means for the individual immunity or nest mate immune response. And uh, we have split this up into an antifungal um, response and antibacterial. So uh, we just here picked two candidate genes, an antimicrobial peptide and the phenol oxidase, which are both um, involved in the antifungal immune response. And we could see that um, nest mates of fungus exposed individuals as compared to nest mates of just sham treated individuals that did not have a pathogen, they have an increased gene expression in both these genes that are involved in antifungal activity, whereas kind of a control gene that um, would act in the antibacterial defense, defense which we have not introduced uh, to the ants uh, in this experiment stayed 
same. And this showed us that there's an upregulation of the antifungal immune response in these low level infected nest mates. And this also relates to, uh, to um, a functional immunity and basically an increased um, possibility of these ants to inhibit pathogen growth as compared to the baseline of healthy individuals. So the nest mates of the exposed individuals have an increased immune function and uh, this directly relates then in a survival benefit of these nest mates of fungus exposed individuals as compared to nest mates of healthy ants only um, with whom these individuals have had contact for five days uh, before we challenged them. And we could see that they then have a one and a half times better survival uh, towards the same dose uh, than the uh, individuals that only have had previous social contact with other healthy ants. So this means we could find that there's really a protective immunization due to the social contact to pathogen exposed individuals. So um, this uh, basically here completes the picture that we see that um, social contact is really affecting also individual immunity uh, in these insect colonies. And um, this is actually a process that has been termed variolation. So this protective effect of low level infections against future disease is something that we found here that, that the ants have basically, they acquire these naturally by social contact. And humans have actually used this in early human medicine before Jena invented um, the modern vaccination, for example, to inoculate or perform inoculation or variolation against uh, smallpox viruses. So uh, we have shown basically here that um, social immunity can reduce host susceptibility. And I would now like to come to the last point here mentioned, namely that it can also affect disease transmission. So uh, to come back here, um, we can see that uh, the infectious particles can spread through the colony along the social interaction network of the hosts. So uh, whilst in the previous work, we have been really looking at the detailed individual behaviors or so uh, of um, a small number of individuals, we here decided to take a whole colony approach. And um, we teamed up uh, with the University of Lausanne where Natalie Stromayet uh, performed a, a postdoc in the group of Laurent Keller. And uh, the Keller group had developed an automated tracking system, which where you can see here very cool photos um, by the Keller group showing that each end basically got glued a QR code um, on the body surface that would then be read by a quite complicated uh, camera system um, to have a real-time detection of the position and orientation of all ants in the colony um, at the same time and here providing two images per second. So um, you can see here our experimental design. There was a nest box um, and the ants were in the nest with a big queen in the middle and the brood chamber. And then the ants had the possibility to go out to a foraging arena uh, where we provided water and sugar. And um, in ants, it's typically not all individuals that are leaving the colony to forage, but the so-called foragers do so. Uh, whereas um, on the other hand, the nurses and the queen, they typically stay inside the nest. Um, so with this uh, method, uh, what one can do is one can infer the interaction by um, basically drawing a trapezoid around each end and by then seeing whether these trapezoids of the different ends are then overlapping. Um, and basically you know how close um, and in which directionality these individuals are sticking to one another. And then you can develop 
uh, a social interaction network based on these um, data. So what did we find here? First of all, we could confirm that um, ants do not have um, a homogeneous interaction network, even when they are not yet in contact uh, with disease. So this is our pretreatment network, where we just looked at the baseline interaction of the colony. You can see here in purple, this is the queen, um, in green, the nurse workers, and in yellow, uh, all the forage and here uh, Natalie made dots um, onto the individuals that afterwards, after, uh, after our pretreatment uh, network was established, um, were then treated with uh, the pathogen um, in this case or with a sham suspension in our controls. And what you can see here is the post-treatment network um, you can see here that um, uh, the treated foragers and also the other foragers, they are basically um, increasing the distance to the nest. So the already existing subgrouping or cliques in the colony have become even stronger. So, um, and uh, we found uh, that uh, these network changes uh, had of course some behavioral changes underlying. And here we always compare uh, the treated uh, foragers as well as their untreated um, forager peer group, the other foragers that were not treated uh, with uh, the nurses and sometimes the queen. So what you can see here uh, is that um, these network changes have come by the fact that particularly the treated workers, but also the untreated uh, foragers, uh, they spend more time outside the colony as compared um, to the, sh in the fungus treated uh, colonies as compared to the sham treated colonies, whereas the nurses um, did not change their time outside. And uh, this then also relates to a higher distance to the colony, and you can see here the exact same picture. Um, so interestingly for us, what was not only that the tree foragers themselves, the infectious individuals for the others, that they showed a behavioral modulation, um, in what we would nowadays always call social distancing, but also that their healthy peer group, the individuals that typically interact with these individuals, that they also uh, performed these changes in behavior. And we were then, of course, interested to see whether these behavioral changes are then affecting the probability of the pathogen spreading through the social network. Um, and here we then uh, quantified um, for all individuals in all colonies, uh, the individual spore load after the social impact. And uh, what you can see here is that the probability of receiving um, a high disease relevant dose was actually decreased in the queens and nurses. So they had a lower chance of developing disease and death um, in these altered social interaction networks, whereas there was no different difference in the untreated forages. And uh, interestingly enough, um, the queens and nurses, on the other hand, had a higher probability of receiving a low load um, of the pathogen that we know from our previous work is actually leading to an immunization effect um, in, the, uh, in these individuals. So um, basically what we could find here is that um, already the ants um, have evolved social distancing as a strategy to prevent disease spread in their colonies and that this is really a good measure to reduce pathogen transfer. With this, I would like to uh, show the completed picture, basically, that social immunity is really a very effective way of reducing disease at uh, a lot of, with a lot of different mechanisms. And with this, I would like to 
thank also my funding agencies and invite um, all of you to our discussion and uh, conversation. I stop sharing now and would like to get started with the discussion. Great job, Sylvia, that was fantastic. Uh, we have a number of questions in the chat box. Uh, would anybody like to start though by asking a question, including uh, if you've already posted one in the chat box? Just as a reminder, you can uh, raise your hand to get our attention by hitting participants down at the bottom and then raise hand in the panel that pops up on the right side of the screen. Or just wave frantically at us, that's also perfectly fine. Looks like we do have a question from Viplavindu Das. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, um, really nice talk, Sylvia. Good to see you. It's been a while. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, amazing work. I was really fascinated to see the social network plasticity paper out because that has been like social networks and ants go hand in hand. Um, I was going to ask you, like, it's more like a two-faced question. When I looked at the network, it was very interesting to see some uh, nest mates, which are probably nurses, have like very thick edges, which means they have they interact more than often than other individuals around. Do you think it is some rudimentary version of what dominance hierarchies look like in wasp societies, where you have some dominant uh, individuals that if you take the queen out, some individual will take over the role and become the queen? So. Is there any biological relevance of finding those nurses that interact more like highly with the queen than other individuals? But I can reply to that. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, yes. hi. Um, yes, yeah, so in these ants in particular, the workers are completely sterile. So if you remove the queen, they can't lay eggs. So there's no uh, knowledge of there being any dominance um, hierarchies in this species. So um, yeah, the thicker edges correspond to more frequent interactions. And well, some individual will occupy a more central position to the network, but we've not teased apart exactly at the individual level, which ones would be uh, the more central. There are some broad correlations with age, but you know, we've not gone uh, any further than that. Yeah, that is going to be our next question. Is like, is there any effect of age on those well, individuals? I can't hear you younger? anymore. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Um, yes, I, I can hear you, Natalie. Oh, you. I, I think I lost her. But no, it was just, uh, yeah. just a curious question. Just I saw that again and it just popped in my mind. The other question I was, because I study uh, the Florida carpenter ants, which are polydomas, which brings me to the question, like how uh, do you think like this polydomy emer uh, evolved mostly also a way to kind of now spatially isolate different populations to make sure disease transmission cannot just spread like wildfire to one uh, colony. If there is some sort of selection pressure and what kind of selection pressures would you think might be effective? So, so I'm sure polydomy has an effect on disease transmission. Now, whether it's an evolutionary cause for it, it's, it's a much harder question to answer, isn't it? Um, it, it's one of the things that I would like to, to study further is whether polydomy species use their spare nests as a sort of a quick reply to an infection. So if an infection arises in one nest, can the ants sort of move quickly to one of the other nests? But it's really early, early days and we haven't yet studied this. And, and as to say whether it's a cause for the evolution of polydomy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far. It's still a lot to do. Sure. I mean, I'm just like being, I know, very optimistic and very <laughs> curious, but I will, I'll leave you with one question that I had from the Conrad paper where you looked at those, like you showed the two fungal immune uh, genes that were upregulated. Do you think like, I, I know the fungal parasites that we study are the Ophiocordyceps, which are not yet known that they do transmit to like trophallaxis and well, allo grooming probably yes, but do you think there is some effect of what kind of parasites they uh, are infected with that also affect uh, the disease transmission and the probably the 
the social immunity, like what kind of behaviors, prophylactic or maybe uh, otherwise, like once they get infected, those things, do you think there's a central, like, oh, one thing for all, or is it like they do co-op different uh, mechanisms? So um, maybe one should mention that uh, we have used this um, fungal system basically as a model system for external pathogens that are sticking to the outside um, of the body and they are then penetrating. And uh, we are not surprised uh, that aloe grooming is a very efficient way to reduce these. Um, and uh, of course, there are other diseases that are probably taken up or uh, where probably aloe grooming is not the, the most efficient way, for example, and then you would probably get very different types of um, transmission dynamics also in, in the colonies. Uh, you would have, for example, we are now mostly interested in a grooming network, but uh, orally transmitted diseases, you would probably want to look at the trophallaxis um, uh, network uh, instead or other behaviors that are that are relevant. Uh, we have found um, that um, multiple of also these particularly fungal pathogens um, there were different strains or different species differ also in their speed of germination and hence the speed how fast they can enter the host body. Um, we have seen that the social immunity, meaning the grooming, the time window in which uh, the ants are able to remove um, the pathogens uh, is actually differing between uh, these pathogens. So the faster they can come into the body, the shorter is the time period where the ants can actually prevent this. Um, and by this, there's also we found that if you have um, multiple pathogens that are interacting in a host population or even on the individual body, the uh, social immunity can hence uh, shape um, the way how these individual pathogens are then competing with one another. So social immunity can also um, shift the balance between different pathogens uh, in their outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia and Natalie. Thank you so much. It's lovely. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So it looks like we have a question from Paul Watson. Paul, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, thank you. Just a little curiosity question. Um, have you noticed whether exposed foragers also keep their distance from uh, larvae? Or maybe even the opposite, possibly, that uh, they interact with larvae more. Possibly larvae are little uh, medicine factories, at least for certain kinds of pathogens. So what I found when I did this analysis was a very clear signal that the forager spent, the exposed forager spent more time outside. And a consequence of that is that any measurement of the time spent on the brood or the spatial overlap uh, with the brood actually showed a decrease. Um, but the tracking system doesn't allow you to have a look at, at more precise interactions such as uh, grooming or, or licking the brood or anything. So you know, it's possible that when they were on the brood, they might have done something differently. But what we had is just based on their spatial location and then spent less time uh, in contact with the brood. Great, thank you. Looks like we have a question from Yun Kang. Yun, you can go ahead with your question. Thank you, uh, great talk. So I have a question regarding, uh, just follow up with a pause question. So you have the experiments pre-treatment and post-treatment, right? So you, so you have the social, social network for the both uh, cases. So did you notice uh, before you were introducing the pathogen, do you see the frequency of the net social network between different task groups? So for example, you have different tasks such as nurse, nurse you have a forager, you have the, you have the ones taking out the trash. Right? So do you see uh, any difference uh, you know, what's the significant, for example, you have variation between uh, the different group contacts, right? So do you see the, uh, how different group contact change? I mean, I, I can expect that decreasing because it already has shown a decrease in the nurse and forager, but how the, the different degree, in a sense, respect the different uh, uh, interaction between different groups? Thank you. 
Okay, so when we looked at the network before treatment, we, we found very clear communities. Um, uh, so you can apply a community detection where you try to find groups of workers that uh, uh, interact a lot with one another, and these matched up with what would measure um, in the spatial behavior. The 4-Hers was the one that left the nest, and the nurses was the one that stayed inside the nest. And we found that the communities we found more or less aligned with this, which confirmed that there are more interactions among nurses and more interactions among 4-Hers and few interactions between. So already in the absence of disease, the network of the ends has this compartmentation. And what we showed was that compartmentation between nurse and forager increase um, after exposure to the pathogen. So we found that we found the, the network itself became more compartmented, so had a, a larger modularity if you know about network properties. And then we also found that uh, the assortativity of the network increased, so that's the degree to which individuals from the same task group preferentially interact with one another. So this sort of preference for their own group increased. Um, and then, of course, we saw a decrease in the frequency of interaction between nurses and for ages among the non-treated workers. So the changes we saw went beyond just the exposed one isolating themselves. I'm not sure whether this replies to your question. Oh, good. Thank you. So I just want to mention because I think uh, myself I'm a math math mathematician, so I'm, I'm not I'm not doing any experiments. But my collaborator, uh, I don't know whether you know her, Jennifer Fuel. Yes. You have a huge uh, social insight group, so she has been uh, and her students have been doing uh, uh, a lot of experiments. Uh, we haven't doing any kind of disease, but we're doing a lot of information, you know, alarming kind of spreading. So uh, we notice for uh, the interactions, for example, the between groups, uh, you have variations between uh, based on your task. So for example, the nurse, because you're taking the babies, right, the, the brood, so you have much, much less contact with the, the, the trash, the, the one taking on the trash. So yeah. because the one you, you face in the trash, you probably you expect to uh, expose to the infectious diseases more, much more often. So I think probably the, before you have this kind of introduced disease, you, we're already observing these, right? Yes. So, so that's why I'm saying, I'm kind of curious to say, after you expose to disease, how this degree have been changing? You know, uh, the degree, so because the, the interactions, right? You, every interactions between different groups, they are all decreasing, right? But they have decreasing in different degree. I'm just I'm just wondering whether you have some analysis to say how, for, for example, the nurse and for decreasing much, much more than the nurse with the food processor, you know, things like that. So we only had two groups in our analysis because, um, so nurses and for ages, because basically the tracking data gives you the location and orientation of each end, but not exactly what they're doing. So it's actually, it would have required making us a lot of inferences to then say, so this is a, a, a brood worker, this is a, a sort of maintenance worker, this is a, a, a water forager, this is... So we, we tried to avoid making mistakes, we actually kept this simple. So we only had these two categories in the analysis. So... I see, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Great, looks like we next have a question from Joaquin Kurtz. Joaquin, you can go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. Nice to see you and thank you for a very nice talk. Um, you have shown that um, the uh, groomers also get some benefit potentially by um, getting a protective immunization from their seemingly altruistic act of grooming another individual. So maybe it's not that altruistic, maybe they benefit. And if that is the case, then um, that should also apply to non-social systems then. So even in non-new social insects and even other organisms, this benefit should lead to such type of behaviors, um, but we rarely observe this actually. So why is that? What is What would be your, your explanation? I think this plays into the evolution of social immunity. So maybe I can hand over to Chris um, uh, because he's also part of it. So you came a bit late, but uh, so Chris is uh, here now. He's a um, former PhD student. And I think, yes, overall, I have to say that uh, there was, um, it's not only benefits, so it's a bit more complicated. Uh, and also um, to um, to bring it to, to other 
group living species and not only the superorganisms that we study is a very interesting. Chris, do you want to mention, comment on this? Yeah, sorry, Joachim, I couldn't quite hear your question. Um, could you just reiterate it again? So it is about the benefits from um, grooming that uh, the those who provide grooming also benefit by getting this protective immunization. And if this is the case, then I would expect that such behaviors should also evolve in non-use social insects and other organisms, because if it's more a benefit than a cost uh, leading to such behaviors, yeah. why don't we see it elsewhere? I, I think so. I mean, it's something which, yeah, there's been a lot of, Sylvia and I especially have been discussing a lot recently, trying to understand how these concepts which we've been talking about in social insects could possibly be applied to other social systems as well. And I think the uh, decision or the, um, the idea we keep coming back to is that it should be about the costs and benefits. So um, I think providing that relatedness is high enough in the social group, then I think any sort of social community behavior could evolve uh, to some extent. Um, but I, 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 I always struggle to imagine why in a group where relatedness isn't particularly high, why you would put yourself at risk of contracting a possibly lethal infection by grooming another individual um, and you know, possibly dying from performing that behavior. Um, that said, if, for example, the, the pathogen, let's say you know, it, it's mites in birds or something like that, um, where generally the prevalence of these mites or whatever it is, is very high and everybody has them anyway, then there's little cost to performing grooming um, towards one another. You only gain benefits by grooming one another because you're likely to have the pathogen already or the, the parasite already. Um, so I think the way we've been trying to think about it is, is from this sort of balance in the, the cost and the benefit with the relatedness um, between, between individuals. So um, I think that you know when there's little cost to performing something like grooming, so your risk of contracting the infection is low or um, the, you know, the cost of contracting that infection is low because it's particularly low virulence or you have the pathogen anyway, then I can't see any reason why grooming shouldn't evolve and something like social immunization shouldn't necessarily evolve in, in, other, in other systems. Um, but I think when that, when that pathogen has particularly high virulence um, or you're unlikely to get the infection unless you perform the behavior, and then I think that would be that would select against something like grooming outside of the social insects. Of course, in the social insects, it's, it's a completely different story because the workers are generally obligate altruists. So um, it's always in their benefit to perform social immunity behaviors. There should be no conflict over um, performing social immunity in a social insect colony like ants. Um, but it would be really interesting to expand now these ideas to things like Polistes wasps and um, you know, other uh, systems where relatedness isn't guaranteed um, like it is in the ants and the honeybees and, and species like that, or, you know, where um, obligate altruism, sorry, doesn't exist. Thank you. And maybe one addition um, also when it comes to the immunological part of your question. So um, we have looked at this immunization and it's uh, clearly there uh, when you reinfect uh, the ants with the same pathogen. We have now broadened um, our studies to also look at um, other second pathogens that are coming in. So basically how broad is this protection and can it also be, uh, has it, can it have a negative side effect of um, carrying a low level infection with pathogen A when you then uh, contract pathogen B. And here we find that actually um, in some pathogen combinations, um, this super infection with a second uh, pathogen can actually uh, be negative uh, for the survival. Um, where uh, we actually found uh, that the ants can somehow kind of evaluate these risks of their previous uh, low level infection with the current risk of um, contracting another pathogen and they are then still uh, grooming the other individual that is infectious with this other pathogen, uh, but they do it in a different way. They um, 
do it um, by less uh, grooming and picking off um, uh, the spores with their mandibles or other mouth parts and instead they are disinfecting them more. So they are still, uh, as Chris pointed out, they are still highly altruistically or they're helping them and really trying to remove the pathogen, but they can actually adjust it also based uh, on the risk, uh, which is then based on their immunological susceptibility uh, against these different pathogens interacting and that is also one point in variolation which is different to vaccination that uh, what we are facing here in this system is that you really have then two live pathogens inside your body that are then uh, fighting with one another or also um, cooperating with one another against the host yeah that, <laughs> that was great thanks for for that uh, discussion i want to move on now to bernie bernie Crespi. go ahead and ask your question bernie Hi, uh, thanks, Charlie. Um, that, that was great, Sylvia. I, I, I love that. I'm, I'm wondering all about the parallels between the ants and the humans, of course. Now, the question I had had to do with the transmission between colonies. So we've been talking about transmission within, and we've been talking about from the perspective of the ants and not so much from the perspective of the parasite in terms of what the parasite can do to interfere with the systems that, that the ants have. So is, is there much that we can say at this point about adaptations of ants uh, or parasites for moving from one colony to another? So for example, one, one way to do this would be to interfere with the colony or the kin recognition system. Uh, of the ants, right? Because then the colonies could just kind of mix, mix together. Um, so, what what do we know now about parasite, the adaptations related to parasite movement from one colony to the other? Can we say much? So, um, I can maybe quickly get started. Um, so. Um, in general, as you have pointed out, ants are highly territorial and they typically never mix with the uh, neighboring colonies. That's also why they are often affected um, by pathogens that um, have a very long uh, survival outside uh, the host in the environment. So basically the uh, transmission between colonies typically takes place by a cadaver lying around um, in the environment and the spores are then picked up by um, uh, individuals from another colony. And often these are actually generalist uh, fungal pathogens um, or bacterial pathogens that are spore formers and have a very uh, long survival in the environment um, because um, social insects are often a dead end for the disease because they're also treating their dead um, Recently, there has been some work um, that uh, ants are leaving the colony when they are uh, infected. And maybe, Chris, you want to um, talk about uh, this behavior in the adults and maybe also the destructive disinfection that uh, you found in the, in the ants again in the They should go invade other colonies if they're infected and make the neighbor, neighbors sick. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's, that's been suggested before, actually. And we, yeah, we haven't looked whether they do something like this. Um, I mean, you do see weird behavior where they, you know, they place dead corpses at the nest entrance and stuff like this. So I wonder what's going on there. But um, yeah, I mean, so we were able to show that they can completely stop this pathogen from being able to replicate. So they can detect the infections before um, brood, which are infected, have died. Um, and uh, very basically very early on in this infectious incubation period they can detect that the brood is infected and so they can act extremely early in the infectious cycle to prevent successful infections from becoming transmissible and spreading um, so that's why Sylvia says that uh, for metarhizium at least so that's the, the fungus which we've been discussing um, and colonies are generally a, a sort of dead end um, um, for these species but then there are um, species like Ophiocordyceps, which can manipulate um, workers into leaving the colony. Um, and what they do instead is to then climb, you know, some vegetation near the colony and then sporulate. And they seem to rain down spores onto foragers, which are 
um, you know, work in Beloit, and they seem to particularly focus on um, these sort of pathways which workers are taken. I think these are the species with, which Bipla Bendu works on. Um, and they they actually can, so at least from data that we have at the moment, not we, but from other people, um, have shown that these, these fungus can reinfect colonies again and again. So they seem to cause sort of a chronic long-term infection that's um, able to avoid the social immune system of these colonies by essentially um, getting the workers to leave the colony before the ants can perform these sort of social immunity behaviors. But it's not clear whether they've evolved that as a response to social immunity or if that already existed because, and, and so they were, they're the only ones which are able to sort of continually reinfect colonies. And um, because we know that this, this sort of vegetation climbing and, and sporulation occurs in non-social species as well. Um, so, but we don't know so much about transmission between colonies with these fungi, but we know that it happens in, in bumblebees and honeybees, and um, that transmission occurs between colonies through shared uh, resources such as flowers. So I think it depends probably on the pathogen. So we know that ants also have lots of viruses as well, including these honeybee viruses. So, um, you know, there is the possibility for transmission between colonies. Um, but a, a nice example is uh, maybe the termites. So work from like Michael Paulson's group in, in Copenhagen. I mean, he seems to have found that there's just zero disease in these colonies. And that could be because there's just so little interaction between termite colonies. Um, that there's just no specialized parasites um, that they could they basically just complete their life cycle within and can't transmit between colonies. Um, the, the obvious would, would be to transmit via the queen, um, but you would have to be such a low virulent pathogen that you might actually end up being a mutualist because you just cannot risk killing the queen when she goes through, through this solitary phase of her life cycle. Um, you know, because it would just, it would kill your life cycle as well um, as the pathogen. Thank you. Okay, we're uh, almost at the end of the hour. I wanted to ask a question. I, I had the same question that Bernie had, but I have a backup question that I'm really curious about. Um, a number of, uh, a number of insects have been introduced to new areas and then become invasive. And I'm just wondering what role uh, disease has played in some of the success of these uh, species and in particular, if any of these kind of uh, social immunity adaptations that you're talking about today have, uh, have benefited any of these species, if there's any evidence for that uh, in the process of becoming invasive. Anything known about that? So um, we are actually studying a lot of invasive ants, um, more for reasons um, that it's easy <laughs> Um, to catch them and that they also have multiple queens uh, and they often they have a, a longer or easier way to keep them in the laboratory but um, we have then also used uh, uh, sister species or so that are not invasive and everything that we have looked at so far was very, very similar between the invasive species and the native species. So it seems that this ants uh, overall seem to be very early in detecting pathogens and to perform a very broad way of how to deal with them with uh, nest sanitation, grooming, etc. So, so far we have mostly seen a very general ways, particularly, or if you now look at this particular points of um, or types of pathogens that we look at, it, all different uh, fungal diseases or so that um, externally infect the ants. So they seem to do it all very similar. We have been <laughs> finding a new interaction of um, an introduced and, and an introduced uh, fungus um, that uh, has come together in this, our last year's Neglectus uh, Labulbinia uh, system, uh, where we could, could really look at how um, now this new, co uh, new co-evolution can maybe start. 
Um, and here it was also interesting that this is called the hedgehog fungus um, that is also able to grab into the into the surface of the ants. And, and we could find, and that could be interesting for people like Joachim as well, that these um, uh, fungi then also stimulated the immune system uh, in a protective way than against pathogens, um, even if it's more like considered like a like a symbiont um, or not really having an own problem, causing an own problem for the ants as a pathogen, as a severe pathogen at least. That's, that's very interesting. And just to close out, I wanted to ask Natalie and Chris um, what you think are the some of the most important applications of the work uh, that you've done on this system, uh, either for things like invasive species like we were just talking about or for understanding human health or understanding uh, conservation questions. I don't know. I'm just curious what you think are the most important conservation implications. Why don't we start with Natalie? Well, um, that's always complicated talking about applications uh, for you know humans from, from ant studies. I think what was really interested interesting. Oh, um, sorry, I'm having issues with my sound for some reason. Um, we can still hear you. Can you. Hear you. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so one of the most interesting bits, I think, was to see that the ants could use their social organization as a mechanism to fight disease. And perhaps this is something that could happen in, in a wider array of social groups. Um, so it's a very easy, quick and easy response. As soon as you detect a pathogen, you can sort of decrease your contacts and so have a, a proactive response. And we see that, in fact, humans have applied that with the uh, recent pandemic. So why not in other primate groups, in other social groups, perhaps this sort of um, behavior is more common than we think. Great. Yeah, Great. I think, um, yeah, sorry. I think that, um, yeah, yeah, as Natalie says, I mean, it's, it's always tricky to make these like direct comparisons, but uh, something that struck me was, you know, when this pandemic started, um, people were sort of flabbergasted that the government regulations in the UK were to just wash your hands and keep your distance. How is this going to be enough to prevent this epidemic? Um, and it occurred to me that this is exactly what the ants are doing, right? They practice social distancing. They are very hygienic. They're constantly grooming themselves. And there's even data showing that ants that enter sensitive areas of the nest, such as the brood chamber or the fungal chambers in the leaf cutting ants, they groom themselves before they enter. Um, so they sort of go through this decontamination. And so I just think that, um, you know, even if there's not direct applications, just knowing that um, these sort of measures are effective and have evolved over millions of years to prevent epidemics in other really complex social systems and, you know, could we utilize these and make them work for us um, as well. And I, if I can, just because I, I wanted to say at the beginning, but obviously I was a bit late, um, I've obviously just started a new group at Oxford working on these sort of questions and if anybody's interested in um, possibly uh, doing any work on this and I'm actually sort of putting feelers out for PhD students um, so yeah sorry just some uh, a plug there that's great I think this is a great way to end uh, this club I've met I want to thank uh, Sylvia Chris Natalie thank you so much for sharing this research with us uh, it's absolutely fascinating uh, thank you, Meredith, as well, for organizing. Thank all of you for attending and coming to this weekly event. Uh, before we go, I want to share with you the uh, next events that are coming up. Uh, we're going to take a week off next week because it's uh, Thanksgiving here in the United States and a very short week, so we're taking off next week. But then on December 1st, we have Michael Rose and Grant Rutledge talking about age dependence and evolutionary mismatch. And we're getting close to the end of our 2020 programming, but you can see we still have two more talks on the schedule, Phil Starks and Noah Rosenberg. And I can assure you we are actively involved in getting the 2021 program up and running. So uh, stay tuned for that. So with that, thanks again, everyone. And I uh, hope to see you in a couple of weeks for the next Club Med. Thanks again to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.